welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm your host, Jim DiLorenzo, the principal of Jim DiLorenzo Public Relations, professional storyteller, I like to say. And my co-host today is Kelly Stewart, the founder of The Positive Business. Nice to see you again, nice Kelly. Nice to see you again, too. It's our second time together here. Awesome. So uh, when we were talking before the show today, yes. we were talking about having a positive attitude mm -hmm. in your business. Mm -hmm. And I use the example of a client of mine who reached out to me with a crisis. Right. And uh, wanting an immediate solution to a crisis that may or may not be a real crisis mm -hmm. other than in her mind at that moment. Right. And what we were talking about is how you can take that moment of crisis and use it to create a positive uh, outcome. Absolutely, you can flip it, right. right? And I think part of the problem, and your client certainly would not be alone in this area, is that we have kind of been conditioned, right, to accept the status quo, and then when something comes up that doesn't, it doesn't feel good, it feels right. like a crisis, right, that's what we address, that's what we pour our energy into, and that's when we unleash our creativity, right, our problem-solving skills, whatever those things are. and to take a more positive approach into your business would say, let's just every day build on our strengths. Sure. Let's every day use the best of what we have that make us unique in the marketplace, that help us get results in the marketplace, and let's apply that to finding opportunities, right? To building the proverbial sure. better mousetrap. And I think one of the things that I found interesting in our conversation, the idea of, I've heard it before, where you say, instead of saying, but, if you say and also absolutely and one of the things that you discussed is what if you could mm -hmm. what if you could do this mm -hmm. what if you could do that or what's like the blue sky vision that you have for your business mm -hmm. is that for something sure. that helps redefine uh, how you relate to your business it really does in a lot of ways and i think what you're describing in there is what we hear a lot from as prob we're natural problem solvers sure. people right and so what you hear a lot of if you are consulting with someone is I can't do this right I'm having a hard time we as service providers have been conditioned to identify a pain point provide a solution right this is good and in many times it's necessary but it leaves on only it paints only part of the picture right, right? And, and it leaves other opportunities on there which is to say well, what, when, when things are going well, what does this look like? And I think that's the greater opportunity for business leaders in general, is to just take this, how do we make it better? Right. How do we work? Right. And there's another thing that we talked about is the fact that, okay, you have positive things going on. Mm -hmm. Things are going well. Mm -hmm. Continue to build on that momentum mm -hmm. so that that little crisis moment mm -hmm. is much easier to overcome because mm -hmm. you've had so many other positive things going on right. along the way. Right, and it does. It, it makes that a lot easier to handle um, because you're in a regular habit then of, of building on your strengths, of looking for opportunities, of saying yes. And there are some very real realities in marketplaces that seem insurmountable at the time, but you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Right. So that's where it starts to come from. And sure. if you reframe it as, well, and I think we talked about this too, if you look at a threat as a business owner, but you look at it so closely that you're like pulling it apart to say, hey, is there an opportunity in there for right. me, in for our company, right? Then you're really taking that threat kind of face-to-face. Uh, -face. You're learning to surf in the tidal wave, right? right? As opposed to just being overwhelmed by the tidal wave. And the what if you could kind of approach really starts to kick in there because when you're looking at something that feels like a challenge or it's a change, disruptive technology, whatever that's sure. going to be, then instead of saying, well, we just can't do it, we can't innovate, right. you know, because this company down the street, they've, they've got it all over, well, what if you could? What would that look like? Yeah. And I think that starts to open up that channel that gets closed off when in crisis mode, it's just about survival, sure. right? basic human physiology the brain gets activated we're going into fear fight or flight or freeze and um, and those are normal things and again those things have to happen it's what stops us from you know getting hit by a car right. you know we have that fear of oh well, I'm not going to step in the road until I check the lights but that shouldn't be the norm in business I guess would be my point <laughs> very interesting way to put it yeah but um, I want to get to uh, we have a viewer question 
And this is right up your alley, Kelly. Okay. And uh, it's a question from David Lotz of Philadelphia. Okay. And he asks, what are some advantages of a positive business? Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of a broad category. Right. But you have an opinion on this. I do, and it's a great question. I, I appreciate the fact that David asked this because the advantage to being a positive business there is one advantage, but it applies to two different situations. So if you're a socially responsible business in terms of a social mission as part of your business model, and we see this in the companies where you buy one of their product and they donate a product to maybe an underserved population, that's a, a, a company that has been started to address a specific social need, which is a little bit different from a company that's just been maybe in business 25, 30 years, but they're becoming more purpose-driven. They're, okay. kind of, they're becoming more socially conscious in as much as how they give back is a little bit more strategic than it's been in okay. the past. And they're becoming more environmentally aware. So they are doing things within their building um, that are environmentally friendly. They're thinking a little bit more broadly about the waste that they create, even if, even in a service industry. We know we can waste a lot of paper, you know, right. with presentations and things. But in a manufacturing industry, they're really starting to look at those. You see like eco-fuel, um, eco-friendly trucks for, right. for some of the oil companies even, or you know, any anybody that relies on that as a distribution model. So in either case, whether you are a socially driven business or you're a business that it has this level of awareness, you're doing these positive things that help you to earn your stakeholders' trust. Because typically, when a company is doing good things, they are, and I'm sure you've seen this, much more comfortable being transparent about what they do. Right. They'd like to talk about what they're doing. Exactly. And the employees, the staff, the team exactly. members are also happy because they mm -hmm. feel like they're part mm -hmm. of a greater good. Exactly. So you have advocates out there who are really talking up your company for you. And the great thing about it is it's all real. And it's all very specific because, again, the company is comfortable being transparent and it's very authentic. And I think that's single-handedly earning that kind of trust through transparency is the primary advantage in, in the context of David's okay. question for what's an advantage of being a positive business. Sure. Well, there's a lot to think about there. But, yes, I, it's a positive aspect of, 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 of change and, 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 and evolution. Absolutely. Well, if you have other questions, uh, here's how to send in your questions to Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S-T-V dot com. Welcome back to Money Matters. Uh, our guest today is Mark Condello. He's the president of Cornell Capital Advisors. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Now, um, we were talking a little bit before the show, uh, and I'm interested in what you do, what Cornell Capital Advisors does, and how who you work with. Cornell Cap, I, first of all, I'm an ex-banker. I've been a commercial banker in the Philly market for over 30 years. Okay. And I've been out on my own probably 20-some of those years now. I okay. left the banking business years ago before the last two meltdowns ago. <laughs> Uh, and what I do is basically help clients arrange commercial financing for their businesses, commercial real estate projects, investment properties, and we also I also have a residential license helping people refinance or buy residential homes and vacation properties, okay. that thing as well. But mostly it's commercial because that's what I'm trained, I'm a credit trained banker, uh, but pretty much in the mid-Atlantic region. So okay. and we're, we, that's what we do, we do some consulting for small community banks, outsource credit underwriting and risk ratings and that sort of thing on a, on a you know, bank by bank basis as they need my help. Now, for a small business owner or, <coughs> or somebody who's starting a business or someone that has a business that needs additional capital, their resources are kind of limited these days, aren't they, because of all the situations with the bank? Yeah, you're banks. absolutely right. I mean, the problem, and I think we talked about it before the program, is I've been in this business long enough and in the Philly, Philly region as well as nationwide, 
A lot of small, medium-sized businesses, when I consider small business, medium-sized companies, companies under 20 million in sales, they used to deal with a lot of the community banks that were around. And okay. the last couple of years, because of the Dodd-Frank legislation, where unless you have a bank that's a billion dollars in assets, you're not profitable. If it doesn't make sense, you have to have the, the amount of compliance and regulatory oversight. You need to hire people to just take care of that. And the small community banks don't have the budget for that. Thus, wow. the reason a lot of them have been absorbed by big banks. And But to answer your question, the problem is, the universe has shrunk a great deal, and a lot of small business people contact me because they're frustrated where to go. Right. Because the people that they knew in Bucks County or Montgomery County, the community banks, they're long gone, and now you're stuck with a lot of the bigger institutions, which I won't mention names, but they want your business, but they don't want your business, sure. and it's a challenge. They just want to have you on the list of right. uh, of clients, but they don't necessarily have the, the uh, interest in you or, right. er, and get to know you kind of thing, where they're agreeable to your needs and, and know what you're, anticipate what you're looking for. Well, it, it, as I said earlier to you, that the problem that we have is bigger banks, and I was, I've been told this by chairmen of some of the larger institutions here in Philly, that the regulators are telling them, if you do a loan under $2 million, it's not profitable enough. You don't want to do that. And that's the backbone of small business people in this country. The wow. average loan may be 500000 sure. a million and a half. If they can't get a bank to lend that money because they don't perceive they're getting enough, they're not going to bother. And that's why the little banks, that was their bread and butter kind of loans. And now them being gone, there's a void in the market. And I think there's going to continue to be a void in the market for this kind of thing. You mentioned an interesting point. I had a conversation earlier today with a gentleman who has started a business in the last six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he has gone out to uh, venture capital firms and uh, presented his business plan, and they tell him he's too small. Mm -hmm. uh, he's only asking for $100,000, right, or right. he's asking for $150,000. Right. No, we're not going to take a chance. And you come back to us when you have that. Right, right. And right. that seems to be kind of another gap in the market, is people yeah. who want to start a business start it responsibly, right. but aren't going to go after a multi-million dollar loan right, right, or, right. Or, or investment. Well, businesses in that size, somebody like you're just mentioning, he's a perfect candidate with, with the Small Business Administration. And a lot of banks here in Philadelphia have a Small Business Administration lending group and they're preferred lenders. Okay. And what that means is they can underwrite on behalf of the SBA, which is closed now because our government can't seem <laughs> to get their act together, uh, but they can underwrite and get approval with waiting until the government opens to issue a number mm -hmm. for that loan. But that's how a lot of startup businesses, because bankers normally don't want to lend to a startup sure. company. You have to have at least three solid track years of track record to lend to. But something like that, the SBA is the best way you're going to have a shot of getting a loan in that, in that kind of sense. Okay. But there's a lot of paperwork yeah. and a lot of uh, items that you're going to need to produce to, to get the bank to give you that kind of loan. It's an interesting conundrum. Yeah, it yeah. really is. It's a challenge. Yeah. So what happens when you then if these banking decisions, these lending decisions, have, are being made in areas that are outside of Philadelphia, well, right? That, yeah. Like, how does that, yeah. when you think about community, yeah. right, you yeah. wear my hat of right. a, a responsible, right. socially responsible business, right. Right. certainly diff different communities throughout the country operate right. differently. They have different vibe, different needs, different populations. Right. How does that factor into the overall health of the community then if these corporate lending decisions, no go, no go decisions are being made about what types of businesses are going to be in the Philadelphia area, how does it impact? It's that? a big impact because the benefit of the small. But when I would have a client that's looking for a loan, and I would bring the president of a mm -hmm. small community bank out, he's the head of the loan committee. He's right. a decision maker. Right. Now I bring somebody out from a big Wall Street set right. bank. They're going to come out, but it's ten layers from the committee process, right. which a lot of them is approval. They can lo approve it locally, but some, depending on the size of the deal, they have to go out of town, wherever their where their bank right. is headquartered. It is a it is a challenge at times because they may not know the area as well as the local banker mm -hmm. does, and they have to get the approval from somebody that doesn't live and thrive in this area. So right. that's the problem with the big banks, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and why the smaller banks are, were really a valuable uh, you know part of the community. Right. There's still a good number of them here, which I deal with on a regular basis, but they're all looking for the writing on the wall that at some time when they get the right price, they're going to sell the bank because mm -hmm. they have to, you know, provide for their shareholder value, mm -hmm. but it's a shame that we're going to lose them because there's no new ones being formed and the regulators don't want any new community banks being formed. It's too much to administer. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. That just answered the yeah, question. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, so, and um, when you see commercials or you hear advertisements for a uh, thing like cabbage yeah. or, or some of these other online mm -hmm. uh, loan oh, yeah. operations. 
What are, what are the hazards that you deal with there? Well, number one, uh, unless I'm part Italian, that is like loan sharking in my uh, <laughs> mind because you're paying. You have a vowel at the end of your name. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you're, it, it is like you're paying in the 20% range. They're debiting your checking account every day for a loan payment. It's very expensive money. Wow. Right. Now, they're lending primarily. A lot of those groups are lending to people that bankers normally don't like to lend to, the contractors, the restaurateurs, mm -hmm. high failure rate, turnover business. But a small restaurateur that needs to buy new kitchen equipment, he can't afford to wait 10 weeks for a bank to get back to him, he's going to pay, look, I'll pay it, I have to do it, I have no choice. Right. It's not a long-term goal. I mean, there some of those firms are doing very well. Yes. You right. guys, you would imagine with the kind of pricing that they're getting, but it's not, you know, a sensible solution for a, a, a person that wants to stay in business long-term. I so don't what, think it's So what are some of the clients and customers that you're working with, what are some of the issues that they're facing right now, and, and how are you responding to them? How are you helping them out? Well, as I say, the biggest challenge is just uh, the variety of where they can get capital. Uh, most of the people that I deal with are bank quality people that have mm -hmm. had, you know, been around for maybe family, two or three generational family businesses okay. mm -hmm. that are into the fourth generation now. And some have great relationships with banks that are still with us, but some, their bank was bought and rebought, and <laughs> they don't know who their account officer is. It's a revolving door. Every time a new account officer comes out, they have to re-educate them about their business. Right. And it's not an easy process. So they want me to come in like, who can we deal with that maybe is a little smaller? That okay. I'm dealing with the senior manager. They, they know me. So if one lender leaves, I'm the president of the bank. The vice chairman knows me. It, there's a little bit more of a, a, a touch there that people can you know rely on. Like a they're, continuity. They're, yeah, you know, the that there's something there. Right? And, uh, well, you're, not, you're never going to get that with the big mm -hmm. banks. It just, they just roll over people so much. And like I said, there's no loyalty in the banking industry mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, people move on. And so they're frustrated right. internally. A lot of them, my friends say, oh, I'm just waiting to retire because right. it's just the, the, there's no enjoyment in this anymore. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope for the future on that. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I I think there's got to be innovation. I think there's going to be a way. There's a lot of other Wall Street conduit type lenders on the real estate side that are out there that are, you know, uh, providing commercial real estate financing. They're very in the box kind of lenders. It has to fit perfectly because it's Wall Street money and it has to mm -hmm. underwrite properly. But I think somebody's going to wake up and figure that we can lend money to small business people, create a fund model, a mutual mm -hmm. fund model, lend money, get a decent return, and have, because most of these community banks, everything they lend against, there's sticks and bricks backing it. You're right. going to pledge your house, you're going to pledge your right. vacation home, your commercial property. They're never going to do something on an unsecured basis. So you've got collateral backing it, where a lot of these other lenders we talked about, they're lending on taking money out of your checking account, but you've sure. got furniture and fixtures which are worth nothing in a liquidation mode. At least right. you have a building if you're doing some more mainstream kind of financing. Hmm. What are some of the al alternative commercial? Uh, well, I think we right. touched on the cabbages right. as the people like that, the on deck and some of these other groups. But uh, uh, there's also been a big push in the credit unions. We okay. do a lot of stuff with the credit unions. Yeah. They're, they're very aggressive in the commercial lending world now. But years ago, they weren't doing it. Uh, you know, so we deal with quite a few of them, and some are very good, and they're very, uh, very aggressive on their pricing and what they're willing to do. But they're underwriting. They have a lot of uh, ex-bankers now working there, so they understand. And they've really built a good process, but uh, that's somewhere else that people can go if they can't get an answer out of their commercial bank. So that's another source. And how does that differ from the old community banks that? that fade away. Well, I like to think that they're more like that. They're, they okay. seem to be a little bit, because they're all owned by their members, so there's more of a community nature to it. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's better in that respect, but some of these credit unions are pretty large. They're pretty large institutions, so, you know, you're dealing with some of that, uh, you know, normal banking type of, uh, you know, you know, process, but for the most part, I think they're pretty good. I mean, the other options you have, there's a lot of private money out there that we tap into. Unfortunately, most of the times we tap into that money because people have had a problem. They're, they've okay. had a bankruptcy, they've had a divorce, they've had health issues. They're behind their IRS liens, but they have a commercial building that has a lot of equity in it that we got to go in there, clean them up, get them a loan, pay everybody off, get them healthy, then we take them back to the mainstream lending world. So there's a lot of, but that's expensive money and you don't want to do that as a, until a, they're really only a last resort. Very interesting. Yeah. And so that's private individuals? Pri private yeah, well, I, we have, in the Philly area, we have quite a few of these guys that have their own capital and they want to deploy it and they want to make a decent double digit return on their money for a year or two mm -hmm. until they get these people back and healthy and then we re you know, bring them back to the mainstream banking world. Okay. So when we look at the future mm -hmm. of all this, this kind of landscape, um, a thought that came to my mind as you were talking earlier for these smaller community banks, 
what opportunity could there be? I, the model that came to my mind was the cooperative, mm -hmm. right? And we see that with you know food cooperatives and things like that. But that's also a business model that's spilling into many other industries. Right. Is that something that would be a uh, potential opportunity for the smaller community banks to kind of form a cooperative alliance so that they become that strength in numbers? Well, they had that. Basically, mm -hmm. what they already do is, well, a little bank has a legal lending limit, and then once mm -hmm. they go over that, they can participate with another bank okay. to, on a loan. So they ha I've always had that relationship. But I, unfortunately, I've put a lot of participations together in my career. And unfortunately, I've seen one bank, once they participate, one bank's trying to steal the other bank's deposit oh. relationship. And oh, so it, it, you know, they're a client, but then they're bringing another bank right. in to help. And it doesn't always go as smooth Smoothly. as you would like it right, to. Right. So it's not always the best idea. Right. So I don't think the cooperative thing on a pure uh, sense uh, would okay. work any, make any sense for any of those institutions. So Understood. maybe there needs to be some more guidelines yeah, there or, or an agreement so. going yeah, in. Yeah. Or maybe they'll see that larger handwriting on the wall right, now right, and right. look at maybe it differently. Hey, look, let's try to find a way to work together and play nice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the uh, uh, needs a, a client should bring to you if they're, if they're looking to get a, a commercial loan? Uh, what type of information would they bring to you? Well, uh, you mentioned that the, we waste a lot of paper, and we <laughs> certainly do. And it is a very rigorous and intense process, even for the simplest of loans. I mean, sometimes I say underwriting a five hundred thousand dollar loan is 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 equally as difficult as doing a five million dollar loan. Wow. It's all about the paperwork. And if you're yeah. an existing business, they want three years of your tax returns, personal business personal financial statement. They want to see, you know, your securities accounts. They want to have your copy of your license. Uh, you know, they want to see what the overall trends of your business are, maybe some projections of where you're going to be. If you own a piece of property that you want to refinance, if you have an old appraisal on that building when it was a couple of years ago. So they get some particular information about that property per se well, until they order an update a report. So as much information as you can put together in a professional manner and sort of help them, give them a one page summary as to what you're looking to borrow, right. what the sources and uses of the fund are going to be used for. Bankers are detailed. They want to see it. If you can show them everything in a logical manner and give them all that supporting financial information, your chances of getting approval is a lot faster because unfortunately people, you know, piecemeal information out there and like I say, eight weeks later, they're still coming back looking for more information. Sure. Right. And do you help your clients? That's what I do. Yeah. I mean, we basically get all the information. We underwrite it. Like, a, as an underwriter, we underwrite it, put a, a complete package together for the banks that we take it to. So when they look at my package, they know within 10 minutes when they read it, if they read it, but a lot of them don't read it, uh, yes, this is a deal we should be able to do and all the supporting financial information are along with it. Well, that's right. great. That's a great way to do Very it. Very valuable. Yeah. yeah. Helpful And service. anymore, it really right. is a, it's, a necess it's a real need because mm -hmm. people, like I said, they just don't have, they run your business, you understand what you do. I don't want to have five bankers out there. I don't know how they think. I don't have time. Right. You go out and let's narrow it down to one or two who's going to be my best source to help me finance and that's what Cornell really does. That's where that's we make great. our money. Um, taking that into consideration, what are some of your long-term views for the commercial lending landscape in, in, the, in, in the Philadelphia market, in the, in the suburban Philadelphia market? Well, Philly's a good market right now. And I mean, I think we do a lot of real estate stuff, loans, construction loans here in the Philly. And I, you know, I worry a little bit that Philly's getting a little overheated with a lot of the multifamily buildings and with the tax mm -hmm. abatement situation, mm -hmm. whether they curtail that or not. Uh, but I think in, in general, Philly's a strong market and it will continue to be a strong market. Again, my concern is that the availability of capital loans to uh, to these borrowers is going to continue to be difficult for the smaller end of the spectrum. Sure. Uh, the larger guys that, you know, I always say the guys that don't need the money, they, they got banks tripping all over <laughs> them. But the people that really need it and are trying to, to develop a property or refinance a property, it's, it could be a challenge. And, it, and I think it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. I don't see really any positive change into it in the near future, unfortunately. Okay. I may um, let you off the hook on that. I'm not sure uh -huh. yet, So, because I've got one more question. <laughs> sure. You mentioned, um, you know, multifamily units, right, like in, in, as part of the housing market here. Do you, could you potentially see um, multi-tenant businesses so that they're, now they are coming up to that that threshold, that loan threshold that the big bank wants, you get several businesses that say, we want to take over this property and we'll we'll do this together so that the loan is a bigger loan. Sure. Would, would that be something it's that they possible. could do? I mean, so you could have like a community with, let's say, the barbershop, the IPA, mm -hmm. you know, the food, the, sure. the bookstore, and they all kind of 
form some limited liability corporation and they go for the loan that way? It's possible. The problem you got to remember, though, especially it's like a shopping center situation. Mm -hmm. You have a shopping center that's fully occupied. That's sure. great. Right. But the but problem with goes. bankers are the, 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 the leases that are in there, and the same thing with your center, are only as good as the financial health of each one of those right. tenants. You could have it fully occupied, but if five of those tenants are ready to go under, mm -hmm. that and you lose all that cash flow in sure. that building, then it can't service the debt. So it's... They, it's yes, it's possible, but mm -hmm. they're going to micro and look at every one of those people that's involved to the nth degree right. that they all collectively could, you know, basically service the debt, and that's not always an easy scenario. Understood. Understood. I remember back to the late '90s with the the tech incubators where mm -hmm. people would do a real estate yeah, play right. where they have office space, right. and they bring them all together, and then they they do the the lending in in, in house mm -hmm. amongst them. But I don't know if that model would work in retail, say, or <laughs> yeah. commercial. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I just, yeah. uh, but uh, now we, we we just see a lot of multifamily stuff right now mm -hmm. because of, you know, the the the, uh, the millennials. So they don't really want to own a house. The old days of owning a home, it's not mm -hmm. what they really want to do. That's why you're seeing all these gigantic developments being put up for a multifamily. But uh, you know, we'll see how many of those they can fill at right. one time. Right. Right. Understood. So, the, thank you for for telling us all that today, Mark. I appreciate it, and thank I you. think the. Um, we really enjoyed having you on the show. Absolutely. And um, I wanted to ask you one, one last question. I'm fascinated by how people start their businesses. So you were in commercial banking. Mm -hmm. You were in the industry. You decided to start your own business. What was, the, what was the tipping point? What was the point at which you said, I've got to start my own business? Well, when I was with, and I won't mention the name of the bank I was with, uh, my boss came into my office and he gave me a list of about 20 commercial clients that were mine that I was managing. And he asked me that we we're going to kick these people out of the bank, tell them we're calling their credit lines. And, we're here. and mm -hmm. these were people that were in the bank for many years, right. were profitable, but the bank was going through a merger and they didn't like their industry or these ridiculous reasons that they came up with. And I told him, I said, this job stinks. I mm -hmm. said, I grew up in a family business. This is not what I'm used to. Well, I want to find a way to help people, especially people that have never been late with us. They right. always pay their payments. So that was the, the sort of the, uh, the last piece for me. And then they let us all go, and I went out and started my own firm and never went back. Did you have any of those 20 people uh, come in as, as your first client? I, I did. I was under, I couldn't solicit any of them, though, unfortunately, no. But some of them did find their way back to me over the years, and I'm still banking with some of them right now. That well, that's just wonderful. Me from back that's in the great. Day. Yeah. 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 That's a great attitude, too. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to serve these people. They yes. Have, they, they've yeah. served us. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Mark. Well, thank you for it. having me. Appreciate it. Next week on uh, Money Matters, our guest will be Lisa Smith, the president of J.A. Moody. So thank you for joining us today on Money Matters. And Thank we'll you. see you next time.